West, who currently funds these humanitarian organizations who do so much good work across the world. Fear one, that your money is supporting regime, uh, supporting groups which are killing civilians, who even may be committing genocidal acts, but you yourself may not be able to distinguish between those things. And two, believe that they are increasing, this money is increasing the number of civilians being taken because you create a perverse incentive. You are far less likely to give your money to these groups at all. And which means that all of the benefits that the prop want to talk about are massively mitigated, and all of the positive things these groups do at the moment are hugely harmed. So the comparative in this debate is the following. What they tell you is what we're able to do is save some people by being harmed in the short term and maybe even the long term in these countries. We're saying that you may well be able to do that, that in the first instance you do this policy, the first time a human rights organisation does this. But what you we say is that the second, like that will likely not be a second time that this will be as effective due to the things I just mentioned, due to the ability for these organisations to continue doing these things because they know there's a chance they may get this funding again. A couple of points of responses. Firstly, just to clear up this idea, she, uh, Tash says this is not a hostage situation. Fundamentally and principally, it is the same, right? You are giving, you are saying that we are going to give you something in return in order, you, uh, in order for you to exchange money, and it's on safety involved. Therefore, it's again another very big principle concession where they're shying away from what they need to defend, right? Secondly, they say that, look, rebel groups are not so bad, and they say, look, Sri Lankan government killed lots of Tamils. I am Tamil. Right? I know that more than anybody. But the sad fact is, if we had given the LTT more money at the end of the war, more civilians would have died. Not because they're callous, not necessarily, but because they would have used that money and those arms to fight back in the last stages of the war, and there's more civilians would have died as a consequence of that. Moreover, we say, even if that didn't exist, you necessarily prolong that conflict, right? That conflict has ended one way or another now. Civilians aren't dying on their side of the house. That conflict would still be continuing. More civilians would be dying because of that money you gave them. Uh, you gave them. Uh, thirdly, this very brief thing Tash mentions at the end, uh, she says that you get uh, on their side of the house to reduce the incentive to join rebel groups. We say no, you massively increase it when you increase their, like, the amount of money that they have and the power that they have. Because it means that it seems now far more likely you can join because they're able to provide you more basic goods and services and protection than they would otherwise when they had less money when they're being defeated by governments. Finally on rebuttal, they say, oh, the NGOs have their own information. This is really important, right? The point that Michael tells you is not that they have that they don't have any information at all, is that they clearly don't have as much information as states have when it comes to these kinds of things. Like, there is obviously the case that like Save the Children or whoever you want to talk about don't have as many people around like Sri Lanka or whatever as like government drones and government planes which they can use. Why is that so important? Only the state has information on the full picture, for example, if it's planning a very important counterinsurgency in the next couple of weeks and it has actively strangled that group into a position where they don't have any arms anymore, where they don't have any funding. You massively undermine that because you don't have that information for the reasons Michael told you, really because they're so secret, right? So let's deal with this idea about this, like, uh, about why uh, she said, uh, Tash tries to recharacterize this debate or this one's about where civilians are trapped accidentally. We say where in the examples where they're often trapped accidentally, this debate doesn't occur but for the vast, uh, the vast amount of circumstances because the groups are more than willing to let NGOs in anyway. Why? Because there's a massive harm to those groups from harming those civilians in those situations. First of all, what we say is that they risk, for example, that those civilians in those large numbers are trapped and malnutrition are like poorly treated, don't have enough food or water, that those groups can overwhelm them in large numbers. That's a huge risk to those individuals. Secondly, you necessarily have to um, rely on the support of civilians on the ground in other situations, right? But you turn that so, like, in the, in, so therefore, like in those areas, not, that's not really what this debate is about. But even in those circumstances, you still now make it more likely for these groups to harm those civilians in order to get this money, or even threaten to harm those civilians in order to get this money, because they know that this money is something that's going to happen, right? We say that's less likely on our side of the house. I'll take closing if they have the international community regards Hezbollah as an illegal organisation because of its ties to Iran, yet it is part of a legitimate government, government in southern Lebanon that provides most of the healthcare in that region. Would they be better or worse off in providing for Syrian refugees if we weren't, weren't able to give them uh, aid? What we're saying is, on the fact that, like, overall, states are better placed to decide these, and, like, even if individuals, like NGOs, are better based to do it in one particular circumstance, this harms their ability to do it in other circumstances where states are better placed to act. 
So why is this? It does need to do with this idea of we'll do it secretly. First of all, like given it's illegal and states have active interest to prevent you from doing it secretly because you're undermining their counterinsurgency tactics, they will sue you for it and they will find out. Secondly, what we say is individuals within these groups, because they know what they're doing is illegal, are very likely at least one person will leak this information to the press to say, look, I work for uh, like, uh, like, uh, like it, one of these organizations and this is what we've done. Note, it only has to come out in public once for the harms we're going to talk about to exist. So what happens now? People fear that their money is going towards funding these groups. They're terrified of this. Why, right? Why are they so terrified? Right? Tash gives a good response of, oh, people realize that costs and calculations need to be made in certain circumstances. Right? We say insofar as that's true, they want states to make that decision because those are, the, uh, those are the individuals they elect and are accountable over rather than individual actors. Moreover, the difference here is you are actively funding horrible groups who they see on television committing active, like, awful atrocities, right? They even don't shy away from the genocide debate. But as an average citizen, you often don't know what, like, if the LTT is committing a genocide against a single East, uh, uh, civilians or just protecting Tamils. Why then are you likely to be risk averse and not fund it anyway? A, because of the horror of what you could be funding. No, people in general don't have a separate amount of money they just keep aside to give to humanitarian organisations. You absolutely have to get that money from them by just convincing them that this money is worth more to other people than it is to you as an individual. You harm that when you say, look, this money may well be incentivizing the hostage taking, may well be funding groups who are killing lots of people, and we say that money then dries up. Why is it so bad even if it dries up a little bit? We say it will dry up a lot, but why is it so bad if it even dries up a little bit? We say it harms every single bit or any single activity that happens by these groups at all, right? So all of the things Michael tells you about whether it be long-term services or even the services provided in those regions where the groups are allowing these uh, organizations in without this deal, right? You harm those civilians. So when Tash says, we want to help more civilians on their side of the house, unfortunately don't, because if this money dries up in any way at all, this happens for the rest of time because people fear that this is where the money is going to and therefore you can't help these individuals. The question we need to ask ourselves at, this, at the end of this debate is will this increase the number of these people being harmed by being taken hostage? We say yes. And even if that were true, we say the money will dry up and therefore this is a completely illegitimate act. Couldn't be prouder to oppose.